I'm uh, delighted to be joined by Peterborough United Chairman Dara McCann for me. Um, Dara, first and foremost, keeping well over stateside? I'm in the walls, Philip. Three kids out there all doing their schoolwork. I've got the TV in the background with statistics, data and figures. I've got not one, but two calculators working on budgets and, and everything else for, for football clubs and other businesses. And yeah, keeping us... As well as I can be, yes, absolutely. I think I'm going to let my missus cut my hair shortly, you know. It's just, uh, she's been in the gym working out, you know. It's, it, we have a gym at home, so she's been doing, like, Zoom sessions with her Pilates gym. And uh, I need to get my ass in the gym, actually, next, because, uh, you know, I've kind of I've put on those 20 pounds I lost in January already. <laughs> How hard is it being a, an owner of a football club right now? Is it, I mean, it's unprecedented, and I guess uh, you can never predict anything like this was going to happen. It's, it's mad. It's, it's just, it's really, really difficult because on one hand, you're, you're obviously very concerned about, you know, the health of people. And you're talking about the nurse next door to you that was taken away with it. And, you know, those people on the front lines. And you, of course, you're very empathetic. You're concerned. I'm concerned about my family. You know, Florida's in lockdown. But obviously, we still have people coming to do the pool and bits of, you know, the essential services they're called. But they're still allowed to come to work, which is astonishing to me. So anytime my missus is opening the door to, someone coming in I'm basically got gloves on and getting the lice all out and cleaning I've got asthma so I, I'd be one of those people statistically would be if you get it it's not good you know kind of thing so I take it really seriously but there's that side of it where you're looking at the health and you're looking at the debts and the global debts and everything else and then there's the other side of it is is that and I know people hate talking about it but people are like people are dying there's thousands of people are dying I know there is and I'm talking about football and I'm talking about life and work but I have to because you know, the pandemic will, will, will go. But also, we have to make sure we've got businesses to go back to because, you know, there'll be a global depression. If people aren't back to work in some form or another soon, if football doesn't resume, there will be a global economic depression. And they're saying the fallout from that, mortality-wise, could be even worse than the pandemic. You know, they build all these models that everyone were, we were, our lives were decided for us based on these models. You know, it was two and a half million in America, it was 500,000 in England. We shut down everything. People lost their businesses. People are going to lose their homes from this. Now they're reassessing those models all the time. But those models already took social distancing into account. But now those same models are like, I think England's gone from 500,000 to 20,000. America's gone from 2.2 million down to 160,000. Now it's been reassessed again to 60,000. Give you an example here in Florida. Florida's got 30 odd million people here. It's nearly as big as the UK, particularly when there are tourists here. And I think there's 15,000 cases in Florida. And they're saying that we've, we were hopefully going to miss that peak wave. Lots of other places in America. And I, we're, we're obviously ahead of England. Mm. So as bad as the debts are, because they're saying the debts obviously lag, but the hospital you know, admissions are down. The ICU figures are down. Obviously, the death figures are going to be the last things to drop. But things seem to be going like that and coming down here in America. So they seem to be getting it under control here. I think England's going to be one of the last ones to follow that because you're getting serious death rates every day. And that's horrible to see. But you are following these models all the time. And you don't know whose model is true or not. You're following scientists on Twitter. And you've got the people. There's, there's two camps. There's one camp that want you to be locked up for the next two years. And then basically we'll have nothing to come back to when we come out of our homes. Never mind being able to afford to eat. And they just want everything locked down. And then there's the other camp where people are like, we can have the argument of both health and economic because that's really important as well. And we need to go back to work. And we're all in this till the end of April. We're all locked down. We're doing things properly and safely. But we have to go back to work. And we have to slowly as a society go about things, maybe differently, but we have to go back because you can't stay locked up for May, June, July. It just can't happen. Because if you think people right now are out there in the parks when they're not, not meant to be, see how bad it's going to be in May and June when they're locked up. There'll be anarchy. People will just go, look, this is democracy. You, you know, you can't take our civil liberties and tell us to be locked up forever. Screw that, we're just going to go out. And that's what's going to happen with people. I wouldn't do that, but that's what is going to happen. So there has to be a calculated effort. There has to be a controlled effort as best we can to, if we have to go back to work and wear masks, so be it. You know, I've got all the masks here. Um, if we have to go back to work and, and have temperature gauges before people go to work, because that's the thing that, you know, when I was going through Dubai Airport, they had the temperature uh, computer system up, so they knew. If we have to do that five-minute test they have here in America, you can buy the machine, they have a five-minute test, so be it. But you have to get people back to work. Businesses have to open. Um, hopefully, this thing's burning out. And that's what a lot of them are saying as well, as it's getting warmer here in Florida. 
it's why the numbers are under control, but who knows if the scientists are right. Hopefully, the vaccines, the therapies, it's all been quicker. Because there's no way we as a, as a world can wait 12 to 18 months for a vaccine. I know they love to go through the testing and testing and testing. It's just not feasible, man. Um, I get with other diseases that they take the time, but a disease that's affecting people's health, never mind the world economy, they're going to have to up the TED. The, because they've already said in Israel, and even here in the States, Johnson & Johnson, they've got a vaccine. But they have to test it, so it won't be available for 12 months. Well, that's, excuse my language, effing bonkers, you know. So if, you, if you're at that stage late in this virus, and they said, oh, we've got a vaccine, but there could be some side effects, I think you'd take it, wouldn't you? Mm. So, you, 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 you know, and you'd be like, look, if that's all I've got left to take, I'll give me anything. So um, I'm hoping, you know, because the hysteria drives you mad as well. And you're not allowed to have an opinion. You know, if you talk about the economy or jobs or work or whatever else, you're like vilified. And what about people dying? Yeah, understand all of that. But we have to, as a society, look to get back to work. And right now, our job is to lock down. Our job now is to make this hit its apex, come down the curve, and basically try and burn this away. And then as a society, when we come back, until there are proper therapies and quick testing and everything else, we're probably going to have to do the few feet apart, wear masks, be sensible with gloves, you know, whatever we got to do, we got to do. But there's no reason people can't slowly, surely start going back to work. As regards to crowds and sports and everything else, I guess that's going to follow. So right now, a lot of us are in that holding pattern of we don't know. And those of us in football who are trying to work on plans and trying to make it come back and people back, it's really, really difficult because you are doing that and you're in the, the heat of the battle of doing that. And then you got people over here who are just basically like, you can't be doing that. There are people dying out there. So why are you doing that? Because preparation's everything. And everyone has to prepare for eventually going back to work. When you obviously see things like today, obviously Rick Parry's letter that's obviously gone to the football, yeah. leaked into the media with regards to playing X amount of games in a certain space of time behind closed doors. Is that where you inevitably think the, the, the football will go to finish the season? Yeah, I, I think, look, you're always buying time. So... 16th of May is fine. I thought it might have been a bit earlier because obviously you've seen Germany and other countries. Well, I think they're going to lift the lockdown here in the States, definitely in places like Florida, probably May the 1st. So slowly but surely people are going to go back to work. And I think if you're in a, a sporting environment of training and you can do it safely, there's no reason you couldn't have done it earlier than 16th. But because the UK, obviously, at that stage of the virus, they, it's horrific. The deaths, the news, the prime ministers in the hospital, they've used the 16th as a template that's kind of the, the, the date they want us to go back to, to train. Uh, and then the plan is June, play the games. We've got it was 58 days to get the nine games plus playoff games done. And right now, I guess it's like no games in front of crowds. We all pray and hope we wake up and there's better testing. Maybe there is the vaccine. Maybe there is therapies where, you, you know, who knows what's going to happen in June. So we're buying time all the time. But I've got no problem with the plan. I know other people are very vociferous and aggressive about, well, that's crazy and this is ridiculous. Look, here's the thing about life and about self-interest and everything else. You're going to have a certain camp of people, some fans, some people to do with clubs who are like, nah, screw finishing this season. We, we're worried about next season. And, and that, some of those group of people are people who are probably close to relegation. Some of those people have got nothing left to play for. doesn't matter about those nine games. They could be 13th, 14th in the table. They're not going down. They're not going up. So they have no interest in the nine games that need to be finished. So they're taking a self, I, I get it. Self-preservation is everything in life. It's what people do. But here's the reality of the situation. We have an integrity of a competition. We have contracts to fulfill. We can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater and go, screw the nine games. We move on to next season. We start again in September. Because if we do that, we, um, was the right word to say here, we forfeit the contracts we've signed, the deals we've got in place, the monies we've been advanced, the TV monies, the sponsorship. So people have to understand, if we have to play nine games behind closed doors and do it quickly, let's just get it done. I know fans don't want to see empty stadiums. I know fans, some fans said today, well, you're going to have fans outside the stadium. That's not going to happen. Because if we have a game on, we're going to have a certain police presence around the stadium to ensure that there are no crowds gathering, there are no people, because that's the last thing we want to do is affect anyone's health. You're talking about a young demographic age group-wise in sports, and I'm not saying this virus doesn't affect them because it affects all ages, but the risk will probably be minimal for sports athletes and whatever else, you know, with no underlying conditions to play football. And if somebody did get infected with it again, the isolation, I presume from what I'm hearing and seeing, is, is that if you test your players and somebody is, is, is the word asymptomatic or whatever else, have already had it, 
they're not going to get it again. And that's what they're saying over here, you know, about basically doing further testing. So I think there's a controlled way of doing it. There's definitely a way of getting all the games played. Let's get it done. Let's fulfill our contractual obligations. Let's get people back to work, footballers, training, playing. Get clubs semi up and running so at least they have hope and at least they financially can start coming through this. You know, yes, people are going to lose money with no fans, but it's five games, home games, or four home games for some people. It's not catastrophic not to have fans for those four or five games financially. It would be catastrophic from the sponsors and the TV point of view if we didn't finish those nine games. So let's just get it done. If we can get everyone back playing and, and give something on TV. The other day I was watching axe throwing on ESPN. Yeah? So if you can offer me Liverpool or Posh playing behind closed doors right now with nobody in the stadium, I couldn't care. I just want to see football. I just want to see sports. Why on earth golf's not been played? I've got no idea. If you've ever seen a social distancing sport, you know, if you had no fans but you'd players out playing golf, I don't, you know, the risk is pretty minimal. Of anything, you know, even if they had to carry their own bags, get them out playing golf so we've got something to watch on TV, you know. But I, I, I'm of that mind. It's like I've got my schedule in the day of what I do and, and some of it's building Lego. But I'd love at some point like American time, which would be like 7, 8 in the evening, UK time, if I had two hours of watching a sports game. God, give me that at the moment. It's just that little bit of hope, that glimmer. So I, I get fans, football without fans is nothing. I understand football without football clubs is also something. So fans can't have it both ways. So if we're going to fulfill and, and, and get this done, let's just get it done. Let's stop all the moaning about, well, if there's no fans, we shouldn't do it. Let's just get the nine done. That gives us a platform then to reset things. That gives us July to have that month off, August for a bit of preseason training. September to go for the new season. So we're a month behind, five weeks behind. That's what we are. It's five weeks. And by then, I'd be an absolute shock. Shock. I mean, I'd, I'd probably give up on the world if by then life isn't pretty much back to normal crowds-wise. If we haven't got this beaten, if we haven't got proper vaccines, proper therapies, you know, proper uh, systems of testing in place, I'd be amazed. So, you know, you would also have to question the, the, the scientific world of like, you're all in this together now. We've got the brightest and best minds in the world. We've got everyone's money. Why can't we get this defeated? This is like a global effort. And if by September they haven't got it defeated, I guess we're all going, geez, what next? So I'd be amazed if by September it's not back to some normalcy where we've got fans and supporters again in stadiums. So, and that would be great. And I know everyone's going, well, you know, next season and, you know, the finance is the game. I'm going to do a podcast episode later, come up with some ideas and how I think clubs can get through this. And there are a lot of clubs that would be in trouble and a lot of clubs that could go into administration. And there's a lot of clubs without sensible planning, some maybe new little rules brought in. Um, if we can do that as an EFL, if we can not so much reset the button like lots of people want to do, but do it in a sensible and clever way. Uh, and a lot of us are business people, so there is a plan and we can come up with a plan. If we can do that, I think our football league will be better than ever when we come back in September and October for the following season. I think it would be, I think we could come out of this proud of ourselves that we've reset the button in the right way uh, and a really, really responsible, financially responsible way. So I, I'm really optimistic about the things that could happen. And I'm not one of those, you know, reading all the headlines, the articles, everyone talking about voiding, everyone talking about no football for you. I, I don't do hysteria. I don't do negativity. Um, I don't do gotcha headlines and stories you know, to sell print or, or sell articles or whatever else. You know, I live in the now, and the now changes every day, obviously. But what I'm seeing here in America is positive stuff every day. The death rates aren't positive. That's horrendous. But all the other stuff, the mitigating factors, you know, the, the, the different statistics of ICU admissions, hospitalization admissions, people leaving the hospital, all that's very positive over here, and particularly in Florida as well. So I, I, I'm optimistic. <laughs> In terms of the supporters, obviously, as you say, they, they have uncertainty, but some have already bought season tickets for next season. Oh. The lifeblood of the football club, not just here, every other football club, because it, no money coming it, in, you rely on it. It's massive. You know, it's like uh, if I could run through a support, all I'd say to supporters who've already renewed is thank you so much. You're lifesavers. And I mean that, truly lifesavers. And for fans out there who can afford to buy a season ticket, and, and I know it's really uncertain times, but if you can afford to do it, and, and the club's working on things where you can do it over two or three months to pay or whatever else. If you can get behind the club, renew your ticket like before, it, it, it keeps us in a great place. It keeps us in a place where we're there. We're back in business. We're, we're, we're there for when the season resumes. We're there for next season. We're doing our bit as owners as well. 
you know, and, and we're working on the, the waste deferrals. We're working with the PFA, the EFL, on things, other things we need to do. We're, 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 we're trying to, everything we can look at and do, we're doing. But we all, you have to understand as a supporter, not only do we have wages, we have sponsorship money that's due in April and May. And you're always like, well, hopefully they will pay. We have commercial box money due in June. All these things were pre-budgeted. So if you look at a budget and then this happens and then you lose football income and then people don't pay and then season ticket holders don't renew and then you've got all of these outgoings on top that are still going on, it's catastrophic. So all we'd say, and I'm not begging our fans, I'm asking our fans as a family to be with us. And, and down the line, we will, as always, like we do, as a united club and city, we pay the fans. And it's great saying, well, the owners are rich and the owners can do this, but the owners have got their own issues as well as the football club. We all have our own businesses. We all have our own lives. We are all invested in the stock market and the financial world. We're not billionaires uh, and we're not greedy. And we don't take money out of the football club. We put it in. We'll continue to do that. But we ask our fans to be with us in doing that as well. And, and we're not asking for loans for our fans. We're asking to buy a season ticket, buy a kit, buy merchandise. You know, as best you can help the football club, if you can afford to do it. If you can't, we understand, not a problem. But if you can, do it. Because we need you and we need you more than ever. And, and, and that's, that's never changed. It's not going to change. So, you know, my job and Jason and Randy's job is to make sure and ensure our football club doesn't go under. Our football club is here. Um, that we have a, a squad and a team and a management team that can fulfill the nine games, try and win promotion. And then if not, or if do, we go to the championship or we can go to League One when we reset in September and we go again. So that's where we are with it. It's, it's, it's horrible to talk about when people are dying. But the reality is, is we have a responsibility to hundreds of employees, including yourself, and, 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 and the community as well. The, the football club's a massive part of the community. It affects thousands of people. And as everyone knows, a large percentage of our fan base is the older generation. It's people who are over the age of 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, and they're in isolation. <laughs> and I, I, I feel for them. And I know they're looking at this and they're worried and everything else, but we just want them to be safe and healthy. And unfortunately, as we go back to work, the most vulnerable probably aren't going to be allowed out of isolation for a period of time. I would imagine if that's how governments are going to do it and going to stage it, people who are most vulnerable to this, and it's a certain percentage of people, they're probably going to have to stay within the confines of some sort of isolation period. We've got to do our best to look after them. But wouldn't it be lovely to give them football again? Uh, and even if they're watching on a computer screen, it beats watching Tiger King on Netflix. <laughs> and, and, and you yourself have given um, supporters something to do because you've got a podcast. You've launched a podcast. You're three yeah, minutes, yeah. Four, 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 one, and it's proving really, really successful. Yeah, no, so I'm shocked. It was just I get this chart thing or whatever else. It was top five for you know uh, podcasts and football in Britain, and you know top twenty for all time podcasts at the moment. So yeah, it's it's surprised me. It's been it's been really really popular. Um, I didn't do it for that. I did it to. Uh, I'll be really honest. Out of boredom. Um, you know, I like hearing myself talk, as everyone knows. Um, and also for our, our older fans, because a lot of them asked for it as well when we were on the Zoom call. So um, episode four, I'll be recording today at some stage. I've done, obviously, episode one, two, and three. Uh, and it's all on all the platforms. Anyone out there who's bored, give it a listen. If you don't like it, turn it off after five minutes, you know. So, but, but it's been really, really good, you know. And, and in terms of how a transfer market would look, say, for example, <laughs> Marvin and Tony is an example, because... Everybody was delighted we were able to keep holding them to the summer. And obviously, from a finance yeah. point of view, it would have increased the um, ability to you know, ask for X amount of figures. I guess you don't really know what's going to happen in the transfer market until it opens again. But you think I, I, it's diminished a little bit? No, I, I, I actually think the, the effect of the transfer market could actually favour lower league clubs. And hear me out on that theory. First thing we've got to do is, if, if, if this season goes into August, to finish, well, then we have an issue because obviously clubs like us would look, would, would have to sell a player like Ivan, um, you know, because of the timing of the market. So we have to look at that as well. Do they extend the transfer market by a month? Do they extend a contract that's expiring by a month or two? So they're all the things we're now working on with the Football League and the PFA to sort out. But I actually think some of the clubs in the Premier League who normally would look at an Ivan Tony and have them on their list, uh, you know, as maybe the third or fourth option. Option one and two is from France or from Spain. You know, that's £20 million player and 50 grand a week or whatever else. Now they're going, because of the finances of what's happened with the pandemic and they have to tighten their belts a little bit, they're probably looking and going, well, a player like Ivan Tony is financially more sensible to go and take that risk on because of the lower wages. They're not going to have to pay £20 million as much as I'd like to ask for that in League One. 
Uh, and you'll probably see the market for a player like Ivan will be even hotter when the transfer market looks up. So I look at it a different way. Everyone goes, oh, the transfer market's going to be in trouble. Yeah, in the top end. There's going to be no more 50 and 100 million pound signings for a couple of years. Probably very few 30 and 25 million pound signings. But that 5 to 15 million pound signing, there's going to be a lot of those. Because there still will be money in football and there will be big clubs and there will be mid-sized clubs and people in the Premier League who will do deals. They still need to have squads that are able to compete and stay in the Premier League. And top end of the championship, you'll have a few who, even though it's bad right now, they'll come through it. They've got wealthy owners and they'll also see it not as an opportunity or to exploit anybody, but they see it as a thing where we can go out and get a player like that. Uh, and, you know, there's where the market heats up. So I'm not really worried about that. I actually think, you know, that, that won't affect us. And, and I'll give you a funny story. I woke up this morning to a text from Baz. And he, I think he's the only person, director of football, who's done a deal during coronavirus. And, and he's, he's agreed a deal with a club who's got one of our loan players, basically to sign them permanently with a transfer fee, with everything else. It's all done during coronavirus time. Only Barry Fry at 75, God bless him, could do that. Uh, and, and, you know, that just made me chuckle. I said to my missus, Baz has done a deal during this. She said, what? But, you know, when we get back to work, when football resumes, whether it's with people or without people, the market will resume. The game itself will resume. Life will go on. And I've been saying this all the time with all the hysteria and the people and everything else. We, we will get back to some normal normality at some stage or another. And yes, football is going to be a little bit different. And yes, there are going to be casualties of this, not just the people who've died. There are going to be casualties who lose their jobs. There's going to be there may be less wages. There's going to be staff cuts. You know, everyone's going to have to tighten their belts, maybe for the better. It's going to happen. But hopefully, as, as the years go by, and I think it'll take, I'm going to say this in my podcast later, it's probably going to take football clubs two to three years to catch up with what's happened with this.